I think one of the major findings is that there is no single definition of identity. Probably the most surprising finding of the study was how often women changed the way that they thought about their sexual identity over time. I think when I began the study, the sort of conventional wisdom in the field was that you know, the main developmental task for a sexual minority individual is to figure out what their identity is, to embrace it, to accept it, uh, eventually to disclose it to others and to just sort of integrate it into your sense of self. And that once you complete that process, you're pretty much done. What I found instead was that between uh, every sort of, you know, two waves of data collection, so I collected data about every two years, at every wave, I would find that somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the sample had changed their identity label from lesbian to bisexual, from bisexual to lesbian, from lesbian to unlabeled. Some folks switched to heterosexual and then they switched back to bisexual or unlabeled. So I found an unbelievably, you know, common experience of variability and transition that certainly ran directly counter to a lot of the conventional wisdom in the field at the time. Uh, and even I, was, I didn't really know how to interpret it or whether it was, you know, absolute. Every time I would collect another wave of data, I would think, well, surely things will settle down at this point. But they have continued to show that sort of variability. Even 10 years out, the proportion of women changing identity labels uh, between waves of data collection still is between 20 and 30 percent. And at this point now, like uh, 13 years into the study, um, about 70 percent of the sample has changed their identity label at least once since that first interview. So that we used to think that change was really freaky and that stability was the norm. And now we know that we had it upside down. Stability is actually pretty uncommon. And transition and change are actually the norm. I think there are a couple of things that account for it. Um, I think the, and, and certainly I found that on an individual level, the, the only thing that consistently predicted a woman's likelihood of changing her identity was the degree to which her attractions were actually more in a bisexual range than in an exclusively sort of same-sex range, uh, which makes a lot of sense, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're attracted to both m women and men, that creates just more possibilities for your relationships and, and for how you're going to see yourself. Uh, and certainly there were women who would describe themselves as being, for example, you know, 75% attracted to women. Uh, and some of them would say, well, that makes me bisexual because I'm still somewhat attracted to men. And other women would say, well, I'm mainly attracted to women, so I call myself lesbian. So women with, with similar patterns of attraction could actually find that different labels would, would you know, comfortably fit the way that they saw their identity. But because of that sort of wiggle room, that interpretive wiggle room, that created a lot of space for change and transition over time. So some of the women that, that I interviewed uh, would perhaps identify as lesbian if they were involved in a long-term relationship with a woman. But if that relationship ended, and because they were still like 25% attracted to men, they would identify as bisexual. So the, the simple existence of, of non-exclusive attractions, I think, created a, a context in which change was possible and, and was actually adaptive in, to the degree that it allowed women to find an identity label that fit her particular circumstance at a period of time. Uh, the only group of women who showed extreme stability and their identity labels over time were the women who described themselves as being basically 100% attracted to women from the very beginning. They showed almost no identity change. So it was very clearly connected to this, you know, sort of understanding of your own capacity for, uh, for different types of attractions and, and behaviors over time. Uh, I think coupled with that, there is more visibility and awareness, I think, of the fact that sexuality is a complicated phenomenon, that uh, it's not just black and white. Uh, certainly, even the label bisexual is more common now than it was, you know, 15 years ago when I first started, you know, reading this research literature. And even now, when I, you know, do programming with 
um, gay and lesbian youth groups or other sort of community centers, there's far more kids who are willing to identify spirit, who don't want to identify as anything at all, who just want to experience sexuality. So we do have more cultural permission now, I think, for the notion that you can, you can sort of know that you're not heterosexual, but not necessarily feel that you have to put yourself into a particular box. And that was certainly a, a sense that I got from a lot of my participants. They said, you know, it took so long to escape from the heterosexual box. Why would I want to put myself into another restrictive box? Why can't I just experience my sexuality as it unfolds, get involved with who I want to get involved with, and not be worried about some sort of standard of behavior that I'm supposed to conform to? That's a great question. Uh, and for a long time, there was no research you know, that really asked the sort of questions that would speak to that. Uh, but the research has gotten better. There are more large-scale representative studies of um, adolescents and adults in America and in other countries that, that ask a broader range of questions about attractions and behavior and identity. And all of those studies consistently show that there is more diversity and variability in the sexual minority population than we used to think. And that in the same way that you find far more women reporting that they're attracted to women than who report that they identify as uh, lesbian or bisexual. The same is true of men. Uh, in, in every study that's been done, you find far more individuals reporting that they're somewhat attracted to the same sex, you know, but not exclusively, and maybe not even in a 50-50 you know, bisexual range, uh, than who identify as, as gay or lesbian. That shows that there's this sort of wiggle room. There's this space for variability that some people will define as gay, some people will define as bisexual, some people won't even define it, you know, at all. But that experience definitely applies to men as well as women. Uh, and there have been some studies, uh, short-term longitudinal studies of men that have found that men are just as likely as women to change their identity label, uh, you know, over, say, 18 months to two year spans of time. So I think right now, probably it's safe to say that there is that capacity for fluidity in both men and women. It does appear to be a stronger capacity for, for women.